Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's out of the end of lonely street, that heartbreak hotel. Well, I'll be, I'll be so lonely, baby. I'll be so lonely. I'll be so lonely, I could die. I'm Stuart Rosenberg from the Leon Hess Business School at Monmouth University. And I have the distinct pleasure of getting to interview Roger McGuinn for an oral history project here at Monmouth. Roger, welcome back to Monmouth University. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back. It's my Great. fourth time, I think. Yeah. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and some of the recording artists that you first became interested in. Okay, I grew up in Chicago, and when I was 13 years old, I had a transistor radio, and I tuned it into a rock and roll station in Chicago, which was WJJD at the time, mm -hmm. and I heard, Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's out of the end of lonely street, that heartbreak hotel. Well, I will be, I'll be so lonely, baby. I'll be so lonely. I'll be so lonely, I could die. Great. And that made me want to get a guitar. Right, right. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, how you progressed with the guitar? because right. you were quite young at the time. Right, I got a guitar and the strings were so high over the fingerboard that I really couldn't play it. I did learn how to play one little thing though. It's a... I gotta tell you, when I first met the Beatles, mm -hmm. George Harrison and I sat down and compared notes on what we first learned on the guitar. Mm -hmm. And the first th thing he ever learned on the guitar was... It was from the flip side of a Gene Vincent record, uh, Bebop Lula. Right. The flip side was Woman Love, and this was a break from it. And we both learned how to play that at the same time. Well, I learned how to do that, and then I got a good guitar with a lower action. They call it the action where the strings are in the... And I, I started playing it, and I took it to school, and I found out the girls liked me better. So I, I kept on playing. It was an encouraging thing to have the girls like you better. I tried doing that too, but yeah. uh, to very little success. Oh, well. <laughs> Uh, and then my music teacher invited this guy, Bob Gibson, to come over and play for us. Right. And he played some really good banjo, and he was an amazing storyteller, and I loved the melodies that he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I asked my music teacher to tell me what kind of music that was, because I'd never heard anything like it before. I'd heard a lot of the other things out there, rock and roll and jazz and blues, but um, folk music. She said it's folk music. And she steered me over to a school that had just opened up that year. It was 1957, and the Old Town School of Folk Music opened its doors in that year. And, in Chicago. Uh, in Chicago, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, other recording artists that uh, early on had an influence on you? Well, after um, I got into folk music, I got into Pete Seeger. I was right. really a big Pete Seeger and the Weavers fan. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I went to see the Weavers, and then Pete and the Weavers split up. And he went solo, and I went to see Pete solo at Orchestra Hall in Chicago, and I was blown away at how great he was as a solo artist. He was able to get the audience singing in three different parts, and he played four or five different instruments on stage and told stories, and he was so engaging. It was, at that point, I, I looked at that and I said, that's what I want to do. Mm. And here I am doing it. Yeah. How did you get your start performing? Well, I was uh, at the Old Town School of Folk Music, and I got good enough that I got a job at a coffee house. Mm -hmm. And after the coffee house job, I went down to the Gate of Horn, where the big time folk singers played. Mm -hmm. And one night I walked down, and there was a jam session with the Limelighters. Mm. And they invited me to play with them, and I played the banjo with them until 5 o'clock in the morning. And they said they wanted to hire me. They were looking for somebody to back them up. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a record to take home and learn the songs. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, some of the songs were ones I already knew, like, a, there's a meeting here tonight. There's a meeting here tonight. I know you by your friendly face. There's a meeting here tonight. There's a meeting here tonight. I went back, and I, I did the audition. And they said, great, you got the job. When can you start? And I told them I was still in high school. Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't do it. For, but they said um, that they were going to do a record in June when I was graduating mm -hmm. high school. And they flew me out to L.A. and I, I did the record with them. Great, yeah. great. So that was my first introduction to being a professional musician, aside from playing in coffee houses. Which and there was, was no turning back after that. No. I, well, I had a one-way ticket, so I had to stay there. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I went up to San Francisco. I took a bus, a Greyhound bus up to San Francisco and hung out at the Hungry Eye. Mm. And then I got a call from uh, the Chad Mitchell Trio and they flew me to New York and I worked with them for a couple of years. And then Bobby Darren came along and hired me away from them. And after Bobby Darren, I went uh, solo for a minute out to LA and I met Gene Clark and Gene Clark, David Crosby and I started the Birds. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, the progression of events. Right, well let's just go back a little bit. Okay. I'd, I'm curious to know about a little bit more about your association with Bobby Darren. Okay, well, Bobby came to the Crescendo Club in Hollywood, and uh, I think he was there to see Lenny Bruce, because we were opening act for Lenny Bruce, and he told me that he was putting a folk segment into his Las Vegas show. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but you know, I've already got a job with the Chad Mitchell Trio. Right. And he asked me what they were paying me, and I told him, and he offered to double it. Mm -hmm. so that sounded attractive. And, Frankly, I'd been a little bit disillusioned. I, I wanted to go somewhere else and do something else. Mm -hmm. know, I'd been with them a couple of years. So it, it was, a, um, I thought for a minute of going with the new Christy Minstrels, but Bobby talked me out of it. He said, you get buried in a big group like that. That wouldn't be a good thing to do. A lot of good people came out of that. Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. Right, really good, a good group. Uh, Gene Clark had been in it. Yep, mm -hmm. that's right. So I worked with Bobby and he was a mentor. I, I used to follow him around and ask him questions about show business and how to do this. And but I'm sure you were quite an aid to him as well because I mean I remember Bobby Darren doing things like you know Mac the Knife and Beyond the Sea yeah. and then a few years later he's, he's playing If I Were a Carpenter right. so right um, well he was he had a heart for folk music but I, I helped him you know, with that direction right mm -hmm. I, I was more steeped in folk music mm -hmm. than uh, rock and roll at the time mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so it was a good uh, symbiotic relationship and then he hired me as a songwriter in the Brill Building mm -hmm. and that was a great experience to be well the discipline it was kind of a day job. I mean, you go there at 9 in the morning, leave at 5 at night, and take a lunch break. It was, it was unlike what I'd been doing, and I loved the road. I loved performing. Mm -hmm. So going to the office every day, whether it's uh, like a music publishing office or any, you know, like any other office, a bank mm -hmm. or whatever, it was very much like a day job, and it didn't really appeal to me. It, it was uh, not my favorite thing. And I started going out as a studio musician and, and right. working with different people. Worked with Judy Collins and Paul Simon and the Irish Rovers and diff different I remember, artists. I remember yeah. the Irish Rovers. Yeah, right. sure. So uh, I, I became a studio musician. And that came in handy later when, when we got the birds together because Terry Melcher, and I know you're going to talk about this, but mm -hmm. uh, he was our producer, Doris Day's son. I know. And he hired the Wrecking Crew to play on the birds' first single, Mr. Tambourine Man. I was the only musician in the Birds allowed to play on it because I'd had five years of studio right. background. Right? I think you ought to tell us about who some of the people who were in the Wrecking Crew because okay, they well, were great musicians. Right, the Wrecking Crew, the, the ones who were on Mr. Tambourine Man were um, Hal Blaine was a drummer. Great drummer. Jerry Cole was a guitar player. Um, Bill Pittman, another guitar player. Larry Necto played the, the Fender bass and Leon Russell played Rhodes electric piano. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that was the crew, that was it. And then I got to play my Rickenbacker electric 12 string and I did the uh, intro. And if you go on YouTube, you can find, somebody's taken the original um, tracks of, of recording that and you can listen to all the different takes. Uh, you can hear Terry talking on the talk back and, uh, okay guys, I think that was a little slow, yeah, try it again. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and like, you hear a few takes and then it gets really good. And mm -hmm. you can hear the, the bass going from the uh, original one to the, you know, that, that roll uh, run up that uh, Larry Nectel did. Mm -hmm. a really good sound. Yeah. That was Terry's idea. Yeah, that's great. Uh, okay, I so you were at the Brill Building for a short while. I guess you had one of those cubicles that uh, yeah. everyone else had. Uh -huh. Did like you have a, a piano in yours? It was or? like eight by five cubicle, you know. It was a, Did it, you have the There was a piano and, and a, a folding chair. Yeah. And a, I think maybe a little table or something, but I don't know, put, put things on the, on the piano. And uh, every noon, Bobby would buy us all uh, cheeseburgers and Dr. Brown's cream soda. And that, yeah. was, that was our lunch. Yeah. yeah. So you probably ran into a lot of the Brill Building 
world building writers like Carol King. And well, in, you know, this is an interesting point because a lot of people would think that mm -hmm. really Carol King was down the street. She she worked for uh, Johnny Kirshner. Oh, that's right. Yeah, uh, she was. I read her uh, bio recently. I did too. And she said a lot of people thought she was in the Brill Building, but she was really on um, like 157 um, Broadway or something. So were Man and Wild there, mm -hmm. and uh, some uh, some of the others. Uh, Cynthia Wild and Barry Mann. I think they were still with. They were with Johnny Kirshner as well. Is that right? Yeah. Is that Aldo music? So, yeah, I think um, Bert Backrack may have been in the Brill Building, but it's a huge office building. It's like yeah. you, you don't see everybody in an and office. And it's still building. there. You might see him getting on the elevator, but uh, mm -hmm. that would be it. You, mm -hmm. know, you go to your cubicle, you spend eight hours there, and you go home. Mm -hmm. And I was there when Kennedy was assassinated. I didn't yeah. learn about it until I got back to the apartment I was staying in yeah. on 53rd Street. You know. OK. Yeah. So at some point in, in that period, 63, 64, you did, you did make the move out to LA and you got the gig at the Troubadour. How did that come about? Well, uh, um, when the Beatles came out, I listened to them on the radio and the job at the Braille Building was to emulate things they heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. And I heard in the Beatles, uh, <laughs> folk music chord changes. There are a million folk songs that have that interval and, mm -hmm. and a lot of their chords were folky and they were doing modal harmonies like Appalachian sounding harmonies. Mm -hmm. They probably learned from the Everly Brothers or whatever, but sure. they were influenced by folk music and they'd put rock and roll beat to it. And that gave me the idea of taking a, oh, the water is white, I cannot cross over, and neither have I wings to fly. And putting a beetle beat to it like this. The water is white, I cannot cross over. And neither have I wings to fly. Build me a boat that can carry fish, and both shall row my love and I. And I took it down to Greenwich Village and started playing it for the people in the coffee houses. Mm -hmm. And they hated it. Mm. They really didn't like it. They, they resented it because they, they were purists about their folk music. Sure. You know, they didn't want to hear like bubblegum teenage music and folk music combined. Right. It didn't make any sense to them. Right. But the guy who ran the coffee house loved it. He put a sign outside the door that said Beatle Impersonations. All right. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how the birds came together? Okay. Well, after the. Um, sort of rejection at, in the coffee houses in New York and the Beatle impersonation sign outside the door. It was kind of embarrassing. I thought it's time to get out of New York. So I went out to LA and I got a, an offer for the Troubadour to, right. op to open up for Hoyt Axton. Mm. And I was the opening act and Roger Miller was in the middle of the bill. Yep. And uh, they were, Hoyt and Roger were doing great. And I was doing folk music with a Beatle beat and it was not going over at all. And Roger tried to help me out. He said, mm, you know, I like what you're doing up there, but you do a lot better if you don't get grumpy with the audience, right. which I was. I was getting showing. I was showing my frustration on the mm -hmm. stage, which mm -hmm. is not very professional. Mm. But I was. I was just a new artist at being a solo artist, so I was just learning how to do that. Crap. Sure. Anyway, Roger gave me some good advice, and and I did. I did come across like I really wasn't that upset about it after. It. And uh, but there was one guy who who liked it, Gene Clark. He came sure. backstage after the show. Mm -hmm. He said. I like the Beatles, and I like folk music, and I see what you're doing. Let's, let's write some songs together. Mm -hmm. And we started writing sort of Beatlesque songs. And one of the first songs we wrote was later picked up by the Turtles and Salt and Pepper, and I think you 2 did it, and you know, quite a few people have done it over the years. It's, you showed me how to do exactly what you do. How I fell in love with you. Oh, 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 it's true. I'm in love with you. There's an interesting story about this song, how the turtles got it. Mm -hmm. We did a demo of it in the birds. We never, we didn't release it in the birds right away. And the guy who, uh, who showed it to the turtles didn't have the demo. Mm -hmm. he, he heard it and he remembered it, but he showed it to them on this old bellows organ that had a, a leaky bellows. And so he couldn't do it at the tempo we did it, and he did it at a slower tempo. Mm. And it, it turned out to be a big hit. I bought the 45 by uh, the Turtles. Okay. I did. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so. Well, there's more to the story. Go ahead. Okay, well, so there we were writing songs and singing them together in the front room of the Troubadour, which incidentally was called the Folk Den. 
mm -hmm. a little place where they, they sold picks and strings and cappuccino and whatever. Mm -hmm. More on the folk den later. Yes, we'll the come folk back den to later that. is something else now. Yes. But, um, one day this chubby little fella came in and started singing harmony with us, and he sounded beautiful. And he, he said he wanted to be in our band. And I said, well, we don't really have a band. We're just writing some songs here. He said, oh, if I could be in your band, I know this guy's got a recording studio we could use for free. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're in. So we had a band at that point. We started having a band. We didn't have a name for it. We thought about calling it the Jet Set and different names. We, we had different names for it. But <clears throat> he took us over to David Crosby. Right, was that was guy. David. Mm -hmm. He took us over to meet Jim Dixon, who was a producer engineer at World Pacific records in Hollywood and Jim kind of embraced us he took us under his arm and under his wings and he became our manager and let us record on the machines at night mm -hmm. after all the sessions were over mm -hmm. and listening back to it we went oh, you know that's not the right sound we wanted to sound like the Beatles right we needed more instruments we needed mm -hmm. bass and drums mm -hmm. so we didn't know anybody like that being folk musicians they didn't deal with uh, drummers mm -hmm. But we saw this guy walking in front of the Troubadour. It looked just like two of the Rolling Stones. We said, hey, let's get him. So we got Michael Clark to come over, and we said, hey, you know how to play the drums? He said, well, I play a little congas, man. I said, good enough. So we got him some cardboard boxes, and we taped a tambourine on top of that, and he learned how to play the drums on that. Just for the look. The look was very important. Yes. Right? I the know you was, guys perfected the he look. He had the long hair, yep. and he looked like Brian Jones and Mick Jagger. Yep. Yep. He was yep. cool. And so we, we had a drummer, and we got Chris Hillman to come over to play the bass, and he mm -hmm. picked it up right away. Mm -hmm. So we had the musicians. We went to see the movie, A Hard Day's Night, copied down what the Beatles were playing so we could see what instruments to buy. Mm -hmm. We got a $5,000 loan and went out and bought a Rickenbacker 12-string guitar and a Gretsch, and a, I think we got a, a, a Guild bass, mm -hmm. not like the Beatles, but mm -hmm. they had a, a Hofner violin-shaped bass. So I don't think we could find one of those and Ludwig drums like Ringo Starr had. So right. we had the whole kit. Mm -hmm. We had the kit. And um, oh, this is an interesting story. Jim Dixon thought we should learn how to chore choreograph, you know, how to dance in, in steps, mm -hmm. like uh, bands did back then, like the Temptations and whatever. So they hired this guy from Las Vegas. I forget his name, Jimmy something. Mm -hmm. And he came in and tried to get us to do this, and we were totally reluctant to do it. We, we resistant. We, we wouldn't, wouldn't cooperate at all. He, he worked with us for about a week. He threw his hands up. He said, you guys don't have what it takes to make it in show business. And he left and he quit. And right after that, we started getting good with our instruments. We started to gel because we had sort of a, a bond. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, well, we'll show you kind of attitude. And we, we started to play well together. Yeah, oh, I saw you guys on TV a lot. And although you might not have had dance moves like the the Temptations. You guys looked great on TV. Yeah, I well, I think it would have been pretty silly to see us doing the, you know, yeah, kicking together. Yeah, I don't know if that would have been the right <laughs> thing to do. Uh, all right, so coming up with the name The Birds, yeah. how'd, that, how'd that come to pass? We were at the Thanksgiving table, mm -hmm. and the turkey was out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was trying to think up a name. We, we had the jet set, and we thought about some other names. And uh, <clears throat> Gene Clark had heard a Dino Valente song called The Bird Seas. Mm -hmm. He said, what, what about The Bird Seas? I thought, oh, that's too cute. You know, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And somebody, I think Eddie Tickner was uh, Jim Dixon's partner in managing us, said, mm -hmm. well, what about the birds? Well, back then, I don't know if you remember, but bur birds meant girls in England. It was like, you know, let's, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. You remember? Sure. sure. I still call girls Well, oh, we didn't want to be the girls, mm -hmm. although it might have been great today, but, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, we didn't want to. So he said, well, change the spelling. What about B-U-R-D-S? And we went, oh, that's not, no, we don't like it. And we came up with the B-Y-R-D-S, and, and we had a name. It stuck. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, just thinking this, the, the fact that there was a British group, the Birds, B-I-R-D-S, yeah. did that cause? We didn't know anything about that. Ronnie Wood was in the group. Mm -hmm. And I met Woody, he, as his nickname is, um, like in 87, we did a tour with Dylan and Tom Petty over in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we were in London, and, uh, and Woody was there. And he, he said, you know, yeah, we sued you guys, but it was only for publicity. Mm -hmm. that was, but when we got off the plane in London, a, a barrister, as they call lawyers over there, came up to us and handed us a writ, which is like a subpoena no kidding. to appear in court. Yeah. And we were sued for uh, usurping their name, which we had. And the did, judge, they, did they have the name first? They had birds, B-I-R-D-S. Right. 
They, yeah. But the judge threw it out because we had the number one hit and they didn't have And they didn't. Have uh, and hit. whenever you hear uh, the British birds on, on the radio, it, they're announced as, oh, this is the British birds. Not oh, to I be see. confused with the birds. You know, Rogers group. I didn't know if they continued to be the birds. I, I didn't really know much about them. Yeah, yeah. They were but Ronnie Woods from the Rolling Stones now. So. Of course. Yeah. Yep, yep. And he would played with, with Rod Stewart first. Yeah. Yeah, and Faces. Right, Faces. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you, you've. You, the, the band is together. You've got you got the name. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about how you guys got onto Columbia. I recently read in the book, uh, which I like very much. It's a great coffee table book if you haven't seen it. 360 degree sound. The Columbia Record Stories story that Columbia, uh, the label that you ultimately signed with was slower than the other record companies like Epic and Decca and Reprise and MGM, among others, to enter into rock, rock and roll. So I'm interested in knowing how you guys ended up signing with Columbia. Sure. Well, you're absolutely right. Columbia was a, a middle-of-the-road label. They were into show tunes and mm -hmm. classical music. Um, Lieber, God, Goddard Lieberson was, was a right. um, like a, an aficionado of... Of, um, I, I forget if he was a, a conductor or something. It was, mm -hmm. it was really, it was like Leonard Bernstein or something. That's right. And uh, I think they were friends, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But so Columbia had a reputation to uphold, and they had Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet and Doris Day and very, very smooth, easy, easy listening music. And rock and roll was something a bit abhorrent to them, I think. Mm -hmm. But they saw all these other labels making a fortune on it, so they couldn't stand by and let let that go by. Absolutely. Without, this is the British invasion that already happened, exactly. and these guys did, wanted to jump on the bandwagon. Right. They were late on the uptake of rock and roll, they and they were scared of it, frankly. And so were their engineers. I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. But mm -hmm. uh, So what happened was we auditioned for Benny Shapiro, who is an agent in Hollywood, and we did a few songs in his living room, and his teenage daughter, 14-year-old girl, came running down the stairs all excited. She thought the Beatles were in her house. And the next day, Miles Davis came over to see Benny because it was his agent. And Benny's saying, you know, a funny thing happened. These kids came over to audition, and my daughter flipped out. She thought they were great. And <clears throat> Miles said, well, kids have a way of knowing things like that. Mm -hmm. So he picked up the phone and called his people, his friends at Columbia Records, and said, I know you're looking for a rock band. I think I got one for you. And they signed us for one single. The deal was one single because they didn't really want to get into rock and roll. And, and they, they said, well, if these guys get a hit with it, then we'll follow through and do the whole album. Right. And then we got Terry Melcher assigned to us, who was Doris Day's son. Right. And Terry hired the Wrecking Crew, which everyone was doing, Phil Spector and the Beach Boys. And yep. everybody was doing, the, uh, like the Righteous Brothers and mm -hmm. Nancy Sinatra. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole town was using the Wrecking Crew. Right. And they're such a tight band. They could, they could knock off a take like, you know, like that. Right. And I have to tell you, the... Uh, the birds were obviously upset. I was the only bird allowed on it. But when we finally did get to play on all our records, and we did play on everything except the, the hit, Mr. Tambourine Man and the flip side, I knew I'd want you. Right. It took 77 takes to get turn, turn, turn in the can, whereas it took like three or four for the wrecking crew. You know, it's like they got two songs in one session. Yeah. We'd have to go multiple sessions to, to do anything. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, those guys were, were very impressive, and some of them are still around. Uh, Hal Blaine, yeah. still around. Yeah. Yep. Larry Nectel passed away last year. Yeah. I was just in Nashville where they, um, the Wrecking Crew movie is, uh, was being shown. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Tommy Tedesco's son, Danny, mm -hmm. put it together. He can't afford to do it, the licensing, because he's got all these hit songs and, and they're hundreds of thousands of dollars to license yeah. them. So he's got this great movie on his hands, but he can't market it yet. Yeah. I th and as you said, Leon Russell was uh, played with them. Glenn mm -hmm. Campbell, Campbell played with them yes. as a guitarist. Yeah, right. Yep. Carol, Carol uh, K. Right. Mm -hmm. Bass player. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wasn't on our session, and Glenn wasn't either. Mm -hmm. um, she thought she was. That was interesting. Uh, when the internet opened up, I got uh, I was on some forum, and Carol K. was saying that she played on Mr. Tambourine Man. Mm -hmm. Well, I happened to have a copy of the contract, and I had you know I showed who was on it. And yeah. Like she may have, may have played the song with somebody else because yeah. a lot of people covered it, but. Yeah. She didn't play our session. Though. Right. Uh, and then, of course, uh, probably right after you guys, then, then Columbia did add more yeah, rock got, and roll. Well, yeah, they, they got, got Paul Revere and the Raiders. Paul Revere and the Raiders. Yeah. Simon and Garfunkel Jim's were on Columbia. Paul, yeah. Right. Well, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to tell you, though, this is sort of uh, an interesting anecdote. In the studio, I, I said Columbia was afraid of rock and roll, and it, their engineers were too. Mm -hmm. Well, they, the engineers 
were afraid of rock and roll so much that they put heavy compression, like limiters, limiting uh, electronics on my guitar sound. Mm -hmm. And it came out sounding great. But it, it had a, like an unintended consequence of it sustaining a long time. It almost turned it into a wind instrument. It became a sound. Mm -hmm. And the reason they put that on there was just to clamp it down so it wouldn't blow up their equipment. Right, kind right. Of funny. Yeah. yeah. And of course, with Mr. Tambourine Man, you know, everything was up going on the up, up and up from there. Well, right, uh, we got a number one hit with it. But mm -hmm. I, they didn't release it for, let's see, we recorded it on January 21st of 65. I remember it in the summer of 65. Yeah, it didn't come out till like the spring. You know, right, but, yeah. right, right. But they sat on it for a long time. I, I, they were really scared of rock and roll. They didn't, they didn't yeah. trust rock and roll. Well, of course, that was the song where the birds came up with their signature sound. Right. Uh, you know, your jangly 12-string Rickenbacker and the great vocal harmonies and... Yeah, let me t talk about that uh, jangly sound. Basically, it's just a banjo style where, where I'm... <laughs> I'm doing Earl Scruggs on, on the mm -hmm. uh, guitar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, you know, that sound has been picked up by uh, the next generation. I mean, I remember when R.E.M., you know, first came out and I said, you know, that sounds like Roger playing, you know? And Tom Petty. And Tom Petty, mm -hmm. yep, for sure. Anything else you want to talk about? I mean, I'm, I'm just personally interested in Terry Melcher's story. Uh, anything else you, you want to add about him since you know he was your producer at Columbia? I got along great with Terry. I thought he was a brilliant producer. Mm -hmm. His uh, forte was AM radio mixing for a, a, like a five inch uh, speaker in a car. Mm -hmm. And he knew how to make mixes that would really pop out of that. Mm -hmm. He didn't like stereo which mm -hmm. was kind of interesting. He, he thought stereo was a gimmick, like remember quadraphonic came along later. He, most people thought that was a gimmick. Mm -hmm. Well, he thought stereo was a gimmick. He never mm -hmm. really embraced it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some of the early birds uh, recordings were not made in stereo. There mm -hmm. were multi-tracks that they had to mix in stereo later. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of an interesting thing. David Crosby couldn't stand, but... Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, maybe my fascination with Terry Melcher, and I don't know if this is something you want to talk about, I think that you know, a couple years later, I think that Charles Manson was looking to record with Terry Melcher, and that got to be a pretty ugly situation all, all the way around. Yeah, Dennis Wilson um, knew Charles Manson. Mm -hmm. and I think he brought him around to Terry's, and Terry may have or may not have offered Manson a record deal. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know what happened with uh, the uh, Sharon Tate and... Of course. And, um, that was the house that Terry I know. had lived in. You know? Yeah, so, so I'm just fascinated just in yeah. terms of you know, how things progressed. It's a gory story. It is, yeah. it is, yeah, okay. Uh, what was Dylan's reaction to Mr. Tambourine Man, Bob Dylan's reaction? Dylan uh, knew Jim Dixon mm -hmm. casually. I don't think they were real close friends, but Jim brought Bob and Bobby Newarth around to our rehearsals before we recorded Mr. Tambourine Man, and we played it for him. And they said, wow, you can dance to it. That's great. <laughs> that, was the, that was the quote. So they were all for it. Bob was not really a rock and roll artist at that point. He was, uh, folk, he was you know, really high on the folk charts. Sure. Um, but you know, after Newport and all the... He went electric, yep. Turned off a lot of traditional folkies. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I remember. Mm -hmm. All right. But, he, but it, he liked it, I it. think it's one of his, the, his favorite versions of any of his, of his songs. Is well, I don't know if he'd ever come out and say that. but. It, he did like it when he heard it the first mm -hmm. time. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember playing him another uh, song. I, I played him. <laughs> All I really want to do is baby be, be friends with you. And we were playing really loud in the right. studio. And he came up and said, what was that? I said, it's one of your songs, man. Yeah. He said, yeah. oh, I didn't recognize it. Yeah. And a lot it. of people ha have, have covered that. I mean, right. Cher when, sang that. Right. Well, I think Sonny and Cher did it in the time signature that Bob wrote it in. Right. I ain't looking to compete with That's you. Right. Who beat our tree on this tree here. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But I put a 4-4 Beatle beat to it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's different. OK. Well, after you guys made your initial splash, can you just share a little bit about what the scene was like in LA in the Sunset Strip because you guys were out out in the West Coast. So, uh, yeah. what was it like back then? It was pretty wild. It was uh, LA was kind of a had a small town feel to it before that, mm -hmm. and um, everybody was pretty straight and square, like the Beach Boys. You know, they all had uh, J.C. bring haircuts and, mm -hmm. and um, wore um, 
V-neck sweaters and, and pinstripe shirts. And yeah, I think Brian hat. changed maybe a year later. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 good vibrations, right. He, yeah. he, he went, got the beads and everything. Mm -hmm. but, but before that, it was kind of a square town. Mm -hmm. And coming from New York and listening to uh, Murray the K and, and like uh, Cousin Brucey and all sure. the people in, on the radio here, mm -hmm. uh, I, I went to LA and it sounded like this on the radio. You know, the DJs talk slow. It's yeah. like it's, it was like a small town and it felt really rural and backward. And, you know, it was interesting. But then when the hippie thing hit, yeah, oh, man, it's like it just exploded. And there, there's this great scene with um, we got to play for Jane Fonda's 21st birthday. And Derek Taylor, who had been the Beatles press sure. secretary, had moved to L.A. and taken on the Beach Boys and the Birds as clients. And his job was to get the birds to Henry Fonda's house on, in Malibu, and so that nothing would go wrong, and we'd have this wonderful show with Jane and play for her birthday, and, and probably leave. You know. Well, he didn't know this, but we had this troop of dancers that followed us everywhere, and they had no rules. They just got high, and they would come with us wherever we went, and they danced this wild, you know, they're half naked and, and swirling around and dancing, and they're doing this up to Henry Fonda. And Derek Keller's panicking. He's going, what am I going to do? And Jim Dixon said, don't worry about it. This is what they want. They haven't seen madness like this since the 30s. Yeah. They're loving it. This is the new Hollywood. And it was. It, was. it, it changed Hollywood. Blast. And movies came out like um, The Trip with um, Peter Fonda. I have it in my personal collection. I do, too. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's not mm -hmm. a good movie, but it's an interesting sort of snapshot. Roger Corman, got, he took acid at that point to, I know. to get the feel. I know that, yes. yeah. I'm yeah. a big Roger Corman fan. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah, I only can enjoy the experiences that you guys must have been having in LA <laughs> vicariously, but we, I'm sure it was a blast. It was, you know, we had a lot of fun. There were some down things. I mean, there was a war between the uh, hard-hatted uh, billy club carrying uh, Nazi booted cops, you sure. know. And, and the hippies, sure. that was uh, really going on. Well, and that just added to you yeah, know, the, the whole phenomenon. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. uh, music critics have said that the birds ushered in a new form of rock, folk rock. What's your feeling toward that term, that phrase? I think it's descriptive. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with it. We mm -hmm. didn't want to be stuck in that category, in that genre. Mm -hmm. So that prompted us, once, mm -hmm. they, once they labeled us, to experiment with uh, jazz, with John Coltrane mm -hmm. and Ravi Shankar, and that's um, when we came up with Eight Miles High with this. Uh, this <laughs> trying to emulate Coltrane's saxophone playing, mm -hmm. and um, they they didn't understand that that was jazz inspired, so they called it psychedelic. That's right, and I am going to ask you about that. I, in fact, I, I want to go through some of your first albums, if if you don't mind, and and we'll we'll get we'll get to Fifth Dimension. Uh, I can tell you, as a kid growing up, I used to I used to use the Rolling Stone record guide to help me with my purchases of essential rock albums, and I'm sure you know this. If not, four of the Birds' first six albums were given five stars, which meant that they were indispensable. So of course I had to add them to my collection. And the other two were given four stars, which meant that they were merely excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, your first two albums, Mr. Tambourine Man, which was released in June of 65, and Turn, 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 which was released in December of 65, were both five-star albums. I'd like to know about how the group, how you guys decided what mix of songs to put onto those albums? Okay, well, the um, final song selection was always up to the producer. Okay. So, in, um, with the first album, uh, Terry Melcher was, was in charge. I, I guess the first two, right? Wasn't he on the turn turn? Mm -hmm. I believe so. I believe so. And then we got Alan Stanton for the Fifth Dimension album mm -hmm. after that. So, um, Terry picked the songs. Terry, Terry was no in charge. Kidding. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he picked it from, from the repertoire we showed him. We had some demos and we played him all the songs we knew. Mm -hmm. And we, we told him songs we liked that we might want to cover and so on. And uh, he picked the songs. And he sequenced the songs as well. Right. So he was in charge of that. Well, the, the thing that was so novel, uh, the thing that was unique about those albums was, was how intelligently they were, they were 
put together, the song selection. I mean, you had a great mix of the more traditional folk music and, you know, more into the folk rock and, mm -hmm. and you know, covers yeah. as, w as well as original songs. Right, we covered Pete Seeger and Pete Bob Seeger. Dylan. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. And we had uh, Gene Clark songs for the first couple. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, I always put a little, a little a sort of a, what they call like a dessert, you know, like a, a teaser at the end, like a we'll meet again or that's right. <laughs> uh, a I funny that. song like yeah. uh, from Dr. Strangelove. Yeah. A funny, funny version of Oh, oh Susanna. Right. <clears throat> that was Bobby North's idea. Mm -hmm. I, I was playing around with it because I had a theory that you could take any song and put a Beatle beat to it and it would come out okay. Right. <clears throat> so I was playing Stephen Foster and <clears throat> Bobby North said, oh, you ought to put that on the record. I said, okay. I did. Not a bad idea. And the yeah. Beatles used to play around with things like right. that, too. Right. It was yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. Whimsical. <laughs> Very. Mm -hmm. um, as a kid, I remember seeing the birds on TV shows like Hullabaloo, Shindig, and then also on the Ed Sullivan show. Can you describe those experiences? What it was like being on those shows? Yeah. Uh, Hullabaloo and Shindig were <clears throat> all lip synced. They, mm -hmm. uh, we'd go there. And it was kind of funny because on the early ones, they didn't have a microphone mm -hmm. or a guitar, a guitar cord. You weren't plugged into anything. Mm -hmm. Later on, we'd take a guitar cord and plug it from one guitar to another just mm -hmm. for fun. Mm -hmm. And they'd have dummy microphones, but it was all lip synced yeah. to, to the record. But the Ed Sullivan show was uh, live. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, it was semi live. We, we sang live and we pre recorded a track in the studio. Mm -hmm. And so when you see the, like, look on YouTube, you can see the Ed Sullivan show of Mr. Tambourine Man and turn, 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 and it's slower, and mm -hmm. it's a little bit out of tune vocally. It's mm -hmm. not the same as a record, but it was live, it was real. And you preferred playing live if you? Well, not really. Uh, I think we got a better sound in the studio. Uh -huh. I think, you know, there's more control. Yeah. You can control pitch and things like that, mm -hmm. and tempo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it, it, watching those, those uh, TV shows, which I love to watch, I mean, I have all of them in my collection, uh, you know, how some of the bands, it was obviously obvious that we're lip syncing. Li yeah. lip -syncing. I know that you, you were uh, friendly with uh, the Spoonful. I mean, right. you, you could see they were horsing around. Yeah. I mean, I have a video of, uh, of the box stops when they, when they p performed the letter a couple years later, and uh -huh. obviously they were lip syncing, and they were, just, they were horsing around. I mean, right. they made it very obvious to the audience that that's what they were doing. Yeah, we did that too. We, we were having a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the first one was a Lloyd Thaxton show. It was a local show yeah. at the time. I think it got syndicated, but it was uh, you know, yeah. started out local. But I do remember that show. Okay. I remember watching it. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have a copy of the concert film, The Big TNT Show. Oh, yeah. Uh, might be a bootleg copy okay. uh, on which the birds performed. Right. Uh, I'd like to know what that experience was like, and also I'd like to know if you had interaction with the producer of that show, Phil Spector. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't meet Phil Spector formally until later, mm -hmm. until after the birds. Um, I don't know. I was hanging around with Dylan and Phil Spector. This was really a cool night. Mm -hmm. I was at the Troubadour, and, and mm -hmm. Bob was there, and Phil, and we're all in this little dressing room. I think Gail Garnett, uh, will we'll sing in the sunshine, yeah, I know. was was to, was she, she was the artist there, and we were saying hi to her. Mm -hmm. We're all up in this dressing room, and Phil turns to me and says, "You're in with the in crowd." Oh yeah, I went, yeah. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> yeah, he was a character even back then. Oh huh? yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a big fan of. of oh, me too. Uh, when I was at the Brill Building, we used to analyze the uh, the records, you know, the Do Run Run and oh, yeah. all the, the Wall of Sound stuff. And yep. we didn't know three-minute about... symphonies. Yeah, we didn't know about the Wrecking Crew and that he would, he'd overdub them like six or seven times to get that sound. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole orchestra six or seven times. I mean, like have seven pianos and seven guitars. And, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very innovative, you know. Uh, all right, so we're, now we're up to, to Fifth Dimension, the Bird's third album, which was released in July of 66. Yeah. That included the single Eight Miles High, which music critics have argued predated, as you started to say before, the psychedelic era that's normally associated with albums like Sgt. Pepper's by the Beatles that were released up to a year later. Mm. So why don't you just tell us how you were able to capture that sound before psychedelia? Well, we weren't trying for psychedelia. As I, I mentioned mm -hmm. before, we were trying to uh, do kind of jazz fusion. Mm -hmm. That was what we were aiming at. Mm -hmm. But people didn't get it. They mm -hmm. just didn't get it. So mm -hmm. it, it's fine. You know, they, they put it where they wanted to, and it worked the way it did. Mm -hmm. But what happened was we, we were on a bus tour 
in the U.S. and I bought a Philips cassette recorder in London. Mm -hmm. It was such a new device that they didn't have any pre-recorded cassettes. Mm -hmm. But David Crosby had a friend in the Midwest somewhere who had John Coltrane's Africa Brass and a Ravi Shankar, the latest Ravi Shankar release. Mm -hmm. And I put Africa Brass on one side of a cassette and Ravi Shankar on the other. And we had a um, Fender amplifier plugged into the AC in the motorhome and we kept flipping the tape over. Shankar, Coltrane, Shankar, Coltrane for a month. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got back to the studio, that's all we could hear. It was like when I started playing, it was like a. It's, it's such a cool song. And I remember it made a big impression on, on me. And I know it was released as a single. Now, the single stalled on the charts because okay. of radio airplay, people getting nervous about the, the meaning of the song and all that. There's a radio tip sheet still in existence called the Gavin Report. Right. They right. came out and said, don't play eight miles high, it's about drugs. Mm -hmm. They took it off the radio. Mm -hmm. that, was, that killed us. It was, it, I think it got up to number eight or something, but it was on its way. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were a lot of songs that, that because of drug or supposed drug references were pulled and would have done much better. I remember Ichiku Park by the Small Faces from maybe a year later, which also stalled on the People charts. People thought Puff the Magic Dragon was about it. I know that, yes. But uh, it's interesting because David Crosby and Gene Clark and I wrote the song. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me what it's about, I say it's about a trip to England and the cultural shock we experienced, the little girls and the street signs being up on the second story of the buildings mm -hmm. and the airplane ride. Mm -hmm. And you ask David Crosby what it's about, he's like, it's about drugs, man. <laughs> yep. Well, that's what I always thought. Well, see, a lot of people did. Yeah. Well, what happened was, and, and I explained this uh, in my show, the um, original title was seven miles high because Gene Clark asked me how high the plane was. And I said 39,000 feet, which is seven miles high. Mm. And he said, no, because the Beatles had eight days a week out, and he thought the number eight was much cooler than the number seven. So I thought, OK, poetic license. We can change it to eight. No big deal. Well, the Gavin Report got a hold of it, and they said eight miles high. Commercial airliners don't fly eight miles high. They must be talking about some other kind of high. So. Yeah. Well, just the whole sound of the song, because it was so innovative, I mean, that uh, probably just fueled it a little bit. I guess. Yeah. Mm. But of course, just a you know. It was a misunderstanding. Record. We can consider it a misunderstanding. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. So the group's next album, Younger Than Yesterday, which came out in February of '67, featured another great Dylan cover, "My Back Pages," uh -huh. as well as the opening track, "So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star," uh, which was covered a decade later by Patti Smith. All right. Uh, did you like the Patti Smith version? Yeah, she was, she's tough. I yeah. like her. I like her, yeah. Yeah. But, um, Did you read her book? I know. Oh, I recommend it. OK. Yeah. The, um, let's see, um, what was the first song you said? Not, My Back Page. My Back Page. I, I was going to tell you how that came to be. Mm -hmm. Well, we fired Jim Dixon uh, as our manager. Oh, there was a whole thing with Alan Stanton and Jim Dixon. Jim wanted to be the producer, but Columbia Records had it a policy that they only used their staff producers, so mm -hmm. they wouldn't let him do that. Mm -hmm. And then he got all upset, and we, we wanted you know somebody else. So Jim was let go. Mm -hmm. And I was going up uh, La Cienega Boulevard in LA, and we both had Porsches. And I pull up to the stoplight, and Jim, Jim Dixon pulls up next to me. Roll, we rolled down the window, and he says, hey, Jim, that was my name then. You, you guys ought to do Dylan's My Back Pages. I said, OK, thank you. And I went home. And I got the record out and learned the song off the record. Well, years later, I guess it was 93, when the Columbia Records had the um, 30th anniversary of Bob Dylan on Columbia Records party at Madison Square Garden. I saw it. I, I, I bought the, what's that, the three, a three CD set, I think. Yeah. They, they had teleprompters at the foot of the stage. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing, my back, 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 I'm doing my back page just looking at this teleprompter going, those aren't the words I learned off the record. That's not all, because you know, I misunderstood the record. Yeah. So that was kind of funny. Um, that's the story on my back pager. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you were great on that. I mean, that was a great reunion. Thank uh, you. There were so many great artists on that. I, I, I'm, I'm really happy to have that CD. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, and, and with regard to uh, So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star, how does it feel to have your compositions, since you wrote that uh, or co wrote it? Yeah, with Chris Hillman. Yeah. 
uh, how does it feel to have your compositions recorded by other artists? Because that's something that the Birds, you know, had always done so well. Right, we were cover artists uh, yeah. for uh, Dylan and Pete Seeger and other people, uh, Carol King, mm -hmm. and Jerry Goffin. Yeah. It felt great. Yeah. It, it's always a tribute. Um, <clears throat> Husker Du did a really good version of Eight Miles High. Oh, I'll have to check that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Good. It's it's real punky and you know, I'm sure. Yeah, very yeah. rough. Yeah. And uh, Tom Petty has covered uh, So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star and Feel okay. a Lot Better. Yeah, and quite, yeah those quite, I've heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite well. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Mike Campbell really got the Rickenbacker parts down. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. I, I don't he's a great it. player. Yeah, he is. Uh, all right. So the Birds performed at Monterey Pop. Right. Uh, in the summer of 67, can you share some of your memories of uh, being involved at that festival? Well, it was great. I, all the uh, policemen that, that I told you about who are kind of our adversaries in L.A., mm -hmm. the cops up there, the motorcycle cops with their hard helmets and their Nazi boots and everything, had orchids on the antennas of the motorcycles. It was like, oh, and, you know, people were smoking things and yeah. nobody cared and it was right. fine. Right. And it was just kind of hippie heaven. I mean, <laughs> it was great. Ravi Shankar was there and uh, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Paul Simon. Well, that's, that's really where, um, uh, I guess, Hendrix really, this is where he got his first really big exposure. Big break, yeah. Uh, same thing with Otis Redding. I mean, I think those two guys mm -hmm. really... Otis Redding, right. Yeah, gained yeah. their exposure. We had, we had worked with Jimi Hendrix at Ciro's. Mm -hmm. because he was in Little Richard's band. Mm -hmm. He was Little Richard's guitar player. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd seen Jimi Hendrix. He, he wasn't Jimi Hendrix. He was just a guitar player. I think he was Jimmy James. Yeah, Jimmy James. Yeah. yeah. And he wasn't doing anything wild. He was just playing, you know, licks. All right, so we're talking about Monterey Pop. One of the organizers of the Monterey Pop Festival, John Phillips of the Mamas and Papas. Mm -hmm. And Lou Adler. And Lou Adler, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, ide identifies you by name in the song Creek Alley. Right. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I knew John Phillips and Michelle in, mm -hmm. in the village. Mm -hmm. we, we all lived at the Earl Hotel, which is now the uh, hotel at Waverly Place. Mm -hmm. And um, I was on the seventh floor, and John and Michelle were down on the second floor. They had a suite, and I'd hang out with them a lot. Mm -hmm. I'd go down there and jam, and we, we were good friends and hung out. And I had been in the Chad Mitchell Trio, and I was between gigs. That was right around the time I was, I was doing coffee houses and, and getting ready to go out to L.A. Mm -hmm. And I told John about the Beatles, and he went, oh, man, that's bubblegum kid stuff. You know, I'm not going to touch that. He was still trying to hold on to be the journeyman and a folk singer. I know. Mm -hmm. And Michelle was <clears throat> along with him on that. Mm -hmm. And then Mama Cass came along, and they got Denny, and they, they, they went down to St. Thomas mm -hmm. on John's American Express card because they were broke, mm -hmm. but he was running up the plastic. So, yeah. And they stayed uh, down there, and they, they worked at, um, let's see, I forget the guy, you know, like something like Pete's Seaside Bar in, um, in St. Thomas, and it was, happened to be on a little alleyway that's only about maybe five feet wide called Creek Alley mm. at the time. Well, we went down there recently to find it, and we did find it, but nobody there knew anything about the story. They didn't know where Creek Alley was, and the only way we found it, we found a placard on the wall that said, this, this used to be called Creek Alley, which was where some pirates had buried treasure once back in the 1800s. Anyway, uh, they were down there, and they were scuffling, they were broke, and they were living off the American Express card. Right. In the meantime, I'd gone to L.A. and got number one hit with the birds, and so had Barry McGuire with That's Evil right. Destruction. We both had number ones. He came out of the new Christie Minstrels, didn't yes, he? Yes, he did, mm -hmm. right. And uh, he was a friend of mine back then. Mm -hmm. I, I knew him and Artie Fidel and all those guys. We used to hang out up in the Laurel Canyon, and that was, we were just buddies. Yeah. Anyway, so John... He figured, wow, if McGuinn can make it, anybody can make it. Yeah. So he went out to L.A. and obviously made it. That must have been a great kick to, you know, to hear that song the first time. And yeah, it was fun. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, all right, so by the time the next album, The Notorious Bird Brothers, was released in January of 68, David Crosby had left the group, and you had changed your name from Jim to Roger. Right. What were the driving forces behind those things? Uh, well, the first thing about David leaving the group, Chris Hillman uh, got really upset with David and he said, we got to fire David. And David was becoming difficult. He was difficult, you know, a difficult personality. Um, and he, Stephen Stills was really kind of trying to, to get him away. He was trying to romance him away from the birds because mm -hmm. he, he recognized David's harmony gift. I mean, he's sure. a brilliant harmony singer and a really good rhythm guitar player mm -hmm. and a good songwriter and mm -hmm. innovative and he was into all these open tunings and it was, you know, a lot of talent there. So 
unfortunately, we fired David. You know, yeah. I, it wasn't a great idea. It was something. It wasn't sort of an impulsive thing to do. Right. And the birds would have been better off keeping David. Right. Obviously. But and of course, from there, you 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 continue to evolve as yeah, as, or as de a group. devolve perhaps. You know? Or devolve. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Uh, and the name change. I was uh, flirting with this Eastern uh, spiritual exercise, and the guru in Indonesia said you'd vibrate better with the universe if you took a name he would give you. So I thought, groovy, I'll give it a shot. And uh, I picked, uh, I sent him a request for it. He sent back the letter R, said pick 10 names that start with R, and I picked names like being science fiction buff, like Rocket. I could have been Rockin' Rocket McGuinn. Yeah. But Roger was the only word, uh, only uh, real name in the bunch, and he sent me back the name Roger, and I started using it. And is Roger your middle name? Yes. So Technically, then. I changed my middle name from Joseph to Roger and started using Roger McGuinn as a stage name, but my legal name is still James. Okay. And, and when I go to the doctor's office, I go, James, and I go, what? You know, like, I don't recognize that name. Yeah, yeah it must have been an interesting time when, when, when you were, when you, when you decided on the name change and all, and there's no looking back, you know, yeah. you are, for Reverend no, Roger, no. Yeah. Uh, well, I changed my name legally in, in uh, AFTRA, and you can only have one name in AFTRA. You can't, you, there can't be two people with the same name. Mm -hmm. So somebody else has Jim McGuinn. That's a DJ up in Seattle or something. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, for the next album, Sweetheart of the Rodeo, released in August of 68, which featured maybe my favorite Birds cover of a Dylan song, You Ain't Going Nowhere, uh, the group had added Graham Parsons. Mm -hmm. Uh, I loved the biography of, of Parsons, Hickory Wind, uh, The Life and Times of Graham Parsons. I think Ben Fong Torres wrote that. Yeah, Ben, ben did a nice job on that. Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. I, I love that book. Uh, can you tell me about, about Graham and, and also on his influence on how the birds continue to evolve or devolve, however you want to say it? Well, after David Crosby was gone, Chris and Kevin Kelly and I tried to work as a trio, and it wasn't, it wasn't working at all. So we needed some rhythm player. Mm -hmm. Chris met Graham at a bank in Beverly Hills and brought him over to our rehearsal studio. Mm -hmm. I wanted to continue in the uh, John Coltrane mode, like the jazz fusion. I asked Graham if he could play any McCoy Tyner style piano. Mm -hmm. He sat down at the piano and did some Floyd Kramer style piano. Mm -hmm. And it sounded good. And I said, well, this guy's got talent. We can work with him. Mm -hmm. And it turned out he was like George Jones in a sequin suit. He loved yeah, country music. That's right. He was Hank Williams, you know, and I didn't have a clue that he was coming from there. But he was so ingratiating and he was so sincere in his love of country music that it bled over, it, it, it rubbed off on us. Right. And he managed to persuade us to all go to Nashville and record The Sweetheart of the Rodeo. That's right. Which was a labor of love because we were so in love with this music. We listened to it day and night on the radio. I, I went to Nudie's and I got some cowboy boots and I got a black Cadillac Eldorado. I didn't put the bullhorns on it like, the, like Nudie had, but I was into this whole country thing. And, and, like, and just like the birds were such innovators in, in terms of folk rock, the birds get credit, and I think this is, this is justifiable, as, as being one of the early innovators of country rock. Right, well, there was um, Graham's band, the International Submarine Band, mm -hmm. uh, prior to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Graham came along and influenced us to go there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I'm sure we did influence a lot of people in that direction. We, we also disappointed a lot of rock fans. They, they said, what is this? You know, because there was a uh, sort of country music was tainted with a political uh, right wing spin. Right. And they thought, wow, you've gone over to the enemy side, man. You know, like you're letting us down here. Yeah. It wasn't anything political, it was the love of the music. To me, country music was just another form of folk music. Mm -hmm. these, are, sure. these are old songs from England, Ireland that got distilled in the Appalachian and, sure. and got souped up a little bit in Nashville. Yeah. That's, that's all. To me, it was just, I loved Earl Scruggs, you know. To me, it, it was just part of that. Yeah. So I didn't see any real betrayal of uh, trust, but yeah. some people took it that way. And we wow. lost a huge chunk of our rock audience. That, Hardcore that, fans that yeah, uh, just the, are the inflexible. Yeah. The album did not do well at the time, but like some, what, 40, 35, 40 years later, it's it became like a... Critically it, acclaimed. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, it's some, some, mo some music critics call it a masterpiece. I'd say it's probably the most uh, respected work the Birds did. Mm. At it's a point. great album. Yeah. yeah. I know that you wrote the song Ballad of Easy Rider. Hmm. Uh, I co-wrote it. Co-wrote it. Yeah. Which you're, which you're credited with the solo performance for on the soundtrack of the seminal film 
Easy Rider. Right. Uh, how did this come about? Peter Fonda was a friend. <laughs> I'd known him since um, Las Vegas and Bobby Darin when Bobby Darin and Sandra Dee played uh, Tammy and the Doctor together in the mm -hmm. movies. And I met uh, Sandra and I met uh, Peter mm -hmm. in Las Vegas in the, like 63 or 62, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. So I'd known Peter and we had mutual friends. Peter uh, was a friend of Stormy McDonald's, who I, I'd gone to high school with in Chicago, mm -hmm. who was a son of Commander Eugene McDonald, who founded the Zenith Corporation. Mm -hmm. And Stormy was a friend of Peter's and they were roommates in college mm -hmm. in, in, in Tucson. And uh, so we, we had mutual friends and we, we were buddies. And um, we hung out together in the, after the birds got to be going. We, we got CB radios and we'd drive around and talk to each other. And he'd come over to my house, I'd go to his house, and we were good friends. And he wanted to save some money on the budget of Easy Rider. Mm -hmm. He dubbed his rock and roll records onto the soundtrack as sort of a dummy, like music track, just to see what music would sound like with the movie. Mm -hmm. And he, it grew on him. He, he, it grew on him to the point where he didn't want to change it. And this is still at a time when people were using uh, Dmitry Tiomkin or somebody to do the score mm -hmm. of, of a movie. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of innovative in, in using rock and roll. But he wanted Bob Dylan to write him a song for the movie. So he flew to New York with a 16 millimeter copy and screened it in a projection room in the city and invited Bob. And uh, Bob sat there and watched it and wrote down some notes on a little cocktail napkin. Said, here, give this to McGuinn. He'll know what to do with it. Peter took the napkin, flew back to LA, and came over to my house, and the napkin was like the holy grail. He said, Bob wants you to have this, man. It's nice to have that, that kind of respect. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I read it, and it said, the river flows. It flows to the that's sea, right. wherever that river goes. That's where I want to be, flow, river, flow. I got my t guitar out, because it didn't have a tune, and I finished off the second verse and uh, put a little finger-picking thing to it. Made, made the song up. It went on the soundtrack, it went on the soundtrack album, and after it came out, about three weeks after it came out, I got a phone call at three o'clock in the morning. This is Bob. What's this credit? I, I don't need the money. Right. You, you can take it off. Right. I said, okay. Yeah. What a guy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Did you get to meet, uh, I mean, I know you, you knew Peter Fonda. Did you get to meet, uh, or did you know Dennis Hopper. And I knew Dennis Hopper Jack vaguely. Nicholson. You know, he was around. He was in the studio when we recorded uh, uh -huh. Ballad of Easy Rider. Uh -huh. And um, after the recording, he came up to me and said, What's that second verse supposed to mean? Like, uh, all they wanted was to be free, and that's the way it turned out to be. I said, Think about it, man. He yeah. went, Oh, wow. That's heavy, man. Yeah. That's, that's, heavy. A, that's, a, that's, that's a good impression of that's him, heavy. too. Yeah. <laughs> and did, did you get to. Uh, you, you knew, uh, Jack, Jack Nicholson? Nicholson? No, no, I didn't. I didn't no. meet Jack. I don't think I met Jack. Although I think Jack was around Ciro's when we were playing there. But I, you know, so was Marlon Brando and a lot of a lot of movie stars. Yeah. And we played Ciro's. The the Vito and his gang, the dancers we had, attracted all the people from Hollywood. Yeah. To Ciro's when we. Well, played I think there. Jack back then was uh, still working with with the monkeys. I think he did uh, the movie Head. He, okay. Uh, I think right. he wrote. Right. 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 Uh, or was involved with. He wrote the trip. And he wrote the trip, yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. All right. So, uh, the birds went through a number of personnel changes, to be sure, uh, with you as the only constant. Yes. Uh, until you ultimately decided to disband the group in 1973. Can yeah. you describe those last years with the group, from you know, from 70 to 73, and any particular recordings that really stand out to you that you'd like to? Uh, Mention. I guess the Untitled album stands out. Mm -hmm. That was um, sort of a comeback mm -hmm. because it's the first album that Clarence White was featured heavily, and then we had a live section and a studio section, mm -hmm. two, two records set. Mm -hmm. And it did quite well. And songs like Chestnut Mirror got a lot mm -hmm. of airplay. And, right. and Clarence White was just amazing on it. And uh, I remember playing live with him. It was such a kick up from the original Birds, the way we played live, to, to I remember playing the Fillmore with Clarence and they hadn't heard Clarence yet. And mm. when, when they heard Clarence, they were just floored. It's like, sure. wow. You know, we, we got three standing ovations. We'd never had that in the birds before. It's yeah. like people just get up and walk out or whatever. But it was great. And um, I, I'd say untitled. And, and we had some really great times and we were on the road a lot. We were on the road 200 days a year. That's a lot. To the point where I blew my voice out. Yeah. You, you have to watch that. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Watch how much you sing because uh, it'll get lower and lower and you won't be able to hit the high notes and mm -hmm. get real gravelly and so on which is what I do now, I'm very careful about 
how many dates I take and where I play. And I think that's wise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was probably the pinnacle of the group with Clarence. And then it started to devolve, and, and we were losing audience and not selling records. Um, the Farther Along album came out, and we didn't uh, sell many of those. We produced it ourselves in London, mm -hmm. so it didn't have any uh, gatekeepers. There, mm -hmm. was, there was no A&R guy. There's right. no, no real producer mm -hmm. to say this isn't, isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And we kind of let it go. And it, it wasn't. It was kind of disappointing. And then David Crosby came along and said, "Let's get the original birds back together." I got a deal from David Geffen, and um, I thought that sounded like a, an attractive idea. And, the birds with um, the other guys who were not really cutting it. So I decided to put that on the shelf mm -hmm. and go with the original birds to see if that would kick back in. And we recorded that album and it, it wasn't bad, but people criticized it for it being disjointed and it held, they, they said we held back our best material, which I, I don't believe that's true, at least in my case. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we did the album, it's not that bad, but it didn't go number one or anything. And we didn't get to tour. With right. it. And so that was uh, kind of my cue to go solo, which I'd always wanted to do since I saw Pete Seeger when I was a kid. And That's right. And I want to do that. And so I did. How, how is Pete Seeger doing now? He's, He's 94. Uh, yeah. He'll be 94 May 3rd. Yeah. And they're going to have a party for him up at the uh, Cultural Center in Beacon, New York. Which I was invited. And that's that's where that's where he lives up that yes, way. Yes, he lives it? there. Yeah. yeah, I was invited to it, but I'm, I'm working in uh, I think I'm in North Carolina that day, so can't yeah. do that. That yeah, unfortunate. He's, but he's okay. I think he's alright. I think yeah. he's got some health issues, but he's yeah. he's still well, working. Ninety four, not so bad. He still goes around and does uh, concerts. Yeah. And his voice is kind of not as good as it was, but he gets other people to sing. He yeah. gets the audience singing like he always did. Yeah, I know he's been important to you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, so you, you, you did some solo work, and you've also done collaborative work since your, since your days with the birds. How about some of the collaborative work? Well, McGuinn Clark and Hillman right. came up in the 70s. That just was an organic thing. Uh, tr the Troubadour was having its 20th anniversary, and I got up to do a couple of songs, and then Gene Clark got up on stage, and we did a couple of songs together. Mm -hmm. And people said, hey, you guys sound great together. Why don't you go out as a duo? Mm -hmm. So I asked my agent if he could book us as a duo, and he did, and we, we did a whole tour like that. And then uh, it started to snowball, and Capitol Records signed us, and Chris Hillman came on board, right. and Crosby almost came on board. And we almost had the birds back together. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was, it was an interesting time, and right. we got a couple of hits, and yeah. back in the top 40, and it was fun. That's nice. Yeah. Always nice to be back in the top 40. Yeah. Uh, and I know that, as you said earlier, I believe uh, you've also collaborated with, with people like Tom Petty. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on um, Back from Rio, Tom yeah. and I, well, Tom and I went on this tour. I was, <clears throat> I'll back it up. We were in, my wife Camilla and I had moved to the Tampa Bay area mm -hmm. in uh, 1985, mm -hmm. around 86. Mm -hmm. Tom Petty played a concert there. And we went to it because we knew the promoter and he got us in. Mm -hmm. And we we're sitting in the audience and it's a stadium, it was sports arena. Mm -hmm. And somebody up in the bleachers threw a frisbee down, hit Camilla in the eye. So we had to go get some uh, first aid. We went backstage. And just as we we're walking backstage, Tom is walking in. He said, Roger McGuinn, you yeah. know, you got to come up and do something. Yeah. Right. So great. So Camilla gets her eye taken care of. And I go hang out with Tom and, and the guys backstage and we work on some stuff to do. We do um, Mr. Cambry Man and sure. whatever. And then um, after the show, we go out to his hotel where he's staying on the beach. And the next day, I go over to hang out with him. And we're playing with uh, kites. We're, we're flying kites. And he had two little kids at that point. Yeah. And we're having a good time. And he mentioned to me, he said, you know, I'm going to go on the road with Dylan in Europe. I said, wow, you're going to have a ball. I, I remember the Rolling Thunder review with sure. in 75. I remember. And it was like two months of uh, just pure vacation. I mean, mm -hmm. it was so great. Mm -hmm. And and so stimulating artistically with all those people and, sure. you know, all the cross-pollination that went on and everything. And I said, you're going to have a ball. I, oh, man, I wish I could go on that tour. He said, well, I'll talk to Bob. So he did. And Bob said, yeah, makes sense. Bring him along. Yeah. So I got to do this Dylan Petty tour in 1987. We started out in Tel Aviv and went to Jerusalem. And then we went to uh, Europe. We went to, like, Switzerland and and um, I think we were in uh, Denmark, and Tom was reading a rock autobiography. And I'll tell you who it was. It was Papa John. 
I, of course, I, read, I have that book, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We're reading about John's problems with uh, drugs mm -hmm. and, and how he you know, really, really got into trouble with that whole thing. Sure. And um, Tom and I, Tom gave me the book to read right after he'd finished it, and I read it, mm -hmm. and we were kind of having a little book review about it, and we decided to write a song about it. So we wrote King of the Hill mm -hmm. based on that. And um, we were playing it, and we kind of didn't think much about it, but when we got back to the States, uh, he said, let's record it. So I flew out to LA and we went to the studio and put it down and nothing happened with it there. But that became a demo that got uh, Clive Davis interested mm -hmm. in recording me for Arista. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I got this record deal with Arista and I had that as, as a song and Tom agreed to, to sing on it with me because mm -hmm. we'd written it together. Mm -hmm. And so we did that and that was a really a fun collaboration. And talking about uh, Tom Petty and of course I know the influence that you've had on him and we've talked about Dylan before. It's just interesting how now I listen to both those guys on Sirius. They each have their own show, uh -huh. you know? Um, yes. On, on satellite. Right, they're DJs. That's right. Yep. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, all right. I know that the Folk Den is important to you, an important project. Right. I'd, I'd like to know, um, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that project. Yeah. Back in 1995, I was listening to a Smithsonian Folkways album of uh, folk, you know, traditional songs. And it dawned on me that I was not hearing traditional music from the new folk singers. Mm -hmm. You'd go to a coffee house and you'd hear singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. uh, confessional songs like Joni Mitchell style mm -hmm. songs. And it ha had become the trend to the point where every acoustic artist was a singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. And nobody was doing the child ballads, the cowboy songs, the sea shanties, the blues, the work songs, the, uh, the prison songs. I thought, what's going to happen? You know, Adetta's going to pass away, Pete Seeger's older. This is 17 years ago, I was mm -hmm. thinking about this. i always been a computer buffy, or like an, a gadget person, mm -hmm. and I had a computer and I knew how to record things at home and put them up on the internet. Mm -hmm. I thought, what a great way to kind of publish this for free. Mm -hmm. So I, I started recording songs, m one a month, with the lyrics and the chords and a little story about the song and a picture, like a coffee table book, and put it up on the internet for free download originally sponsored by the uh, University of Arkansas, moved over to UNC Chapel Hill later, because mm -hmm. they had real audio, which was mm -hmm. a big deal back mm -hmm. then. Now it's all MP3s. Mm -hmm. And I started doing this one a month uh, in hopes that people would download them and learn them and share them with their families and friends and keep them alive. Mm -hmm. And it's been going very well. Like school systems have picked up on it as their curriculum. Terrific. Yeah, yeah. in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a passion of yours. Well, it is. It's a labor of love, and mm -hmm. it's something I enjoy doing. And it's just fun for me, too. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just a, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But it, it is working, and I believe folk music is healthier. The traditional side of folk music is healthier than it was 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure my contribution is done. Well, that, I, believe it hasn't I, hurt. I believe I saw yesterday, because I missed it when... I, I guess when, when you first got it, but weren't you nominated for a Grammy Award for a collection I of was, some I of was, your favorite songs from right. Folk Den? Yes, we, we did uh, an album called Treasures from the Folk Den on um, Appleseed Records. Mm -hmm. And we had Pete Seeger and Joan Baez and Judy Collins and Odetta mm -hmm. and Tommy Makeham and Josh White Jr. and Gene Ritchie mm -hmm. all contribute, uh, all do duos with me mm -hmm. on various songs. And yeah, it was nominated for a Grammy. Well, congrats. The Birds, the birds never got a Grammy nomina nomination. Yes, we did. We oh, got we, we were nominated for Best Artists of 1960, Best New Artists of uh -huh. 1965. Tom Jones won that. So two, two Grammy nominations. Yeah. Yes. But. Yeah, I've had another one too. Um, I think we got one for uh, Chris Hillman and I did an album with a nitty gritty dirt band, uh, Made the Circle Be Unbroken. Right. We got a nomination for that Great. too. We even flew to LA and we're at the Grammys. And cool. And needless to say, it must have been a thrill getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame back oh, in the early 90s. Of course. Yeah, it's always a, a thrill to be nominated or to be included in anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one last question. Any chance of a Birds reunion? I'm really not in favor of it. Uh, and I quote Paul McCartney when, when John and George were still alive, and they said, you ought to get the Beatles back together. He said, no, you can't reheat a souffle. Mm. And that's the truth. It would never be the same. It would be just a bunch of guys doing it for the money. Yeah. 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 I, I'm sure a lot of fans would love it, but yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, that's fine. That's great. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Roger.